on the seat. <laughs> so. I uh, heard a story by Kent Hughes, who is a pastor. Some of you may have heard of him, even read some of the things he's written. But he wrote a, a story, or he told about a story, in which he was doing climbing a mountain. He was going to climb, climb Mount McKinley, which is the highest peak in the continental U.S., and if you've ever been on a mountain climb, it's, I'm sorry, did I say Mount McKinley? Mount Whitney is in the continental U.S., sorry. Uh, I, I grew up, I was in the Northwest, so uh, I think about that other mountain that's a little higher. Uh, but uh, up there when I was in the Northwest, uh, we had a lot of folks in our church who were mountain climbers. In fact, one of them set the world's record for hitting the most peaks in the U.S. in the shortest amount of time. Now, some of them, like Kansas, was driving through. You know, he didn't have to do a whole lot uh, at those. So he did it like in 50 days. Um, but you've got to be thinking, he's climbing Mount McKinley. He's climbing all these mountains. It's incredible. I think I learned a lot from those men. I wasn't personally a mountain climber. Uh, I like casual hikes. Um, but when you get to the mountain climbing, it is demanding on your body to do so. And so as he was climbing this mountain, he had two things going on, and this is speaking of Ken Hughes, and one was the stress of getting to the peak, but the other thing was the beauty of the mountain as he climbed. And then as they ascended and, and, and reached the peak, he said it was worth it. It was absolutely breathtaking. As he looked out and saw bodies of water that were this beautiful turquoise color, he saw the shimmering uh, of the sun as it went through the peaks and valleys that surrounded the mountain. The birds were, were out singing. He just saw everything. He said, this is absolutely stunning. And then about that moment, one of his friends spoke up and said, and think about this. 80 miles from here is Death Valley. And in Death Valley, it's just the opposite. It's the lowest place in the continental U.S. And it's called Death Valley for a reason. The heat and the rough terrain lead people to death if you go visit there. And he said it just struck him the contrast between those two places in such a short span of geographic area. And it just reminded me of the contrast that we have in this life. And we speak about it in our language, light and dark, good and bad, and we have a lot of different ways we talk about the contrasts of life. But there is no greater contrast of life than we're going to get in the text that we look at this morning. And it's in your uh, notes there in the bulletin. If you have your Bibles, electronically or otherwise, you may want to turn there. Uh, it's in the book of Ephesians. And if you're visiting or you uh, jump in and out, we um, are actually just walking through the book of Ephesians. And for a lot of what I've done, the computer timed out, so we'll just deal with that. You'll have to follow my notes, which makes one less thing I have to do. Uh, but as we're going through this study of the book of Ephesians, we've seen at the very beginning, chapter 1, God just talked about all the blessings that are in Christ Jesus. If you are a follower of Jesus, all these things are true of you and for you. And he continues that thought as he begins in chapter 2. And we're building to what he is going to eventually do is after he lays forth the foundation of us understanding the beauty of our faith. In chapter 4 he's going to say, now in light of that there are certain ways you should live. But he does sprinkle things throughout these first chapters about the transformation it should be in your life. And in this text, there is no greater text that I know that speaks of the contrast of someone before Christ and after Christ, someone outside of Christ and someone in Christ. And it's highlighted by verse 4 by two little words, but God. But God. I want to get a t-shirt that says, but God. Now, a lot of people would say that sounds like a complaint. What it's saying is that without God, this would be true. And I know each one of us can probably think about our own lives and where we might be, but God did something. I know it's true of my life. And even as a Christian, looking at times when I walked or wandered or my heart was pulled away, and I might have gone down the wrong path, but God did something. And so in this passage, we're going to look at life. Before Christ, and I've titled it, that section of it, Dead Men Walking. And then the second part of it is, but now in Christ, he's going to tell us what is new. And I've titled that part, uh, Life Men Working. Now, we could just title that Flourishing, but it's too long of a word. 
but it's what does it mean to be truly alive in Christ? And so he's going to go through that in this text. Let's start in chapter 2, looking in verse 1. And we just see what our condition is in Christ. I'm going to read at this point down through the end of verse 3, and then we'll pick up the rest of it in a moment. And you were dead in your trespasses and sins. I'm sorry, this may be a different version than you have printed, but you can follow along. And you were dead in your trespasses and sins in which you once walked, following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience, among whom we were all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and of the mind, and were by nature children of wrath like the rest of mankind. Let me point out three things that he says about life before Christ. You're deceived, you're depraved, and you're doomed. Now, if you haven't trusted Christ yet, bear with me for a moment. (laughs) Hear me out. Uh, Don't run out the door. Uh, Just hear what's being said, and that's an easy outline and a way to remember this text. But the first one is that we are deceived. Look at what he says in verses 1 and 2. He talks about uh, walking... Uh, according to the course of this world. Now, where does the course of this world get its game plan, its map? Well, it follows it up. Following the prince of the power of the air. Now, in our day, we use the term misinformation. Is anybody tired of hearing that term? The fun thing about misinformation, it depends on who you're talking to as to what information is misinformation and what true information. There's articles and studies being written about this in Harvard and all these places. And yet what we have to know is that misinformation means anything that is outside truth. If there's a way to know truth, then anything outside of that is, in this case, deception. A New York article time uh, has said something recently, and they did a study of people who Identified and seen misinformation, and then even those who have succumbed to misinformation, and and why is that? And this is what they came to with a very simple statement. The number one reason people follow misinformation is that belonging is stronger than facts. So whatever subgroup of the world in which they belong, being part of that group is more important than the facts. Now that may be true of your political alignment, it may be true of your religious alignment. It can be true of a lot of different things that you identify with as a subgroup. And if you think that taking a view opposite of them will cause you to be disenfranchised, the likelihood is you won't do it because belonging is so important. And we have to recognize that. It's like a high schooler. You know, we always talk about peer pressure. And, you know, a high schooler that succumbs to temptation or goes with the wrong crowd because of peer pressure, because they want to feel like they belong. The amazing thing is we as adults never really outgrow that. Now some of you are saying, oh yeah, but I'm an independent thinker. We'll talk later. (laughs) Uh, Oftentimes independent thinkers gather together with a group of independent thinkers, and then they all think alike. Um, We can talk about that all day. Uh, Another thing that came from the Pew Research and Elon University study said the number one thing that they saw in misinformation is this, the information environment will not improve. In other words, they don't have a hopeful look to the future of what this looks like, especially with AI and everything else coming out. But the reason they came to it was fascinating to me because this is a non-Christian group that they said the reason that it's not going to get better is because of the nature of mankind. And the nature of man is self-preservation and doing what they believe is best for them. So if they need to cheat, send misinformation, do whatever is needed so that they flourish and they get what they want, then... Mankind tends to do that. Now, that's a pessimistic view of mankind. <clears throat> but there's definitely truth, at least within the segments. It amazes me why people spend the hours they do to send viruses out on computers that they never will make money for. It's just the joy of causing chaos. And that's part of the world in which we live. And I use the term deception here very clearly because what we're talking about in this text and in the scriptures is a battle for truth. And yet deception by its very nature means that you don't know you're being deceived, right? I mean, if you know you're being deceived, you still believe it and go with it. we got other issues. 
But for most of us, we can live in such a way that we hear something, we believe it's true, when it's actually deception. And so I would just say this uh, very quickly. If you don't have a standard of belief that is unchangeable and given to you by somebody outside of the context, then you're never going to understand the fullness of truth. And that's why we hold the Bible to be so important. Because the Bible is that standard by which spiritual truth and so many other truths in the world should, in fact, be measured. And so, as we walk through this text, we'll continue to come back to that idea. The second thing we see is that this deceived nature is actually the work of demonic powers. Now, most of us, the, the, you know, sometimes it makes you feel uncomfortable. You think about demonic powers, you think about the old guy with the red horns and the cape on. Uh, you know, I, I love C.S. Lewis in his wonderful work, screw tape Letters. He, he talks about that and he says, yes, let's let them believe that's the character of who we are. When in reality, they are intelligent beings who watch and deceive. And so they may watch your life and they might know what your weaknesses are and they will deceive or entice according to that. Uh, one of the quotes from C.S. Lewis's book on screw tape Letters says this, it does not matter how small the sins are, provided that their cumulative effect is to edge the man away from the light and out into the nothing. Murder is no better than playing cards, if cards do the trick. Indeed, the safest road to hell is the gradual one, the gentle slope, soft underfoot, without sudden turnings, without milestones, and without signposts. That is so much of what Satan's strategy has been in a free country like the United States is to just make us soft and make us comfortable and then slowly pull us away from devotion to the living God or even from considering him in what we do. So the question that we need to just constantly be asking and making sure that we're going to see that we're on the other side of this as people uh, that belong to Jesus, but we need to continue to have an alert antenna that we are not leading the falsehoods of the world's pattern. We need to be constantly, in another text it says, holding your thoughts obedient to Christ. So that which comes in, whether it is of our own thinking or somebody tells us what it is, that we need to think through that. By the way, my watch was, a, was an Apple watch and it died on me, so I don't know what time it is. <laughs> <laughs> So an hour from now, just wave at me. <laughs> Actually, I have it on my computer, so it's real small. So we'll keep on. Uh, the second picture of this is depraved. And that picks up in verse 3. And in verse 3, it says that among uh, these individuals, they once lived, and they lived in the passions of the flesh, carrying out the desires of the body. And so this is the person who simply lives for the pleasure of the moment. Uh, and, and sometimes in our world today, it's living by the emotions. You may remember the old song, You Light Up My Life. I was going to sing it. No, no, don't, 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 don't go there. Don't go there. Um, he was going to accompany me. But uh, there's a wrong line in there that you'll remember. It says, it can't be wrong if it feels so right. If that's not a lie, I don't know what is. Because just because something feels good to you does not make it right. In fact... Sometimes that may be the very point to see that it is wrong because, in fact, it's infringing upon others and your following of Christ. So be careful that in this depravity, we tend to hear that word. And I love the word depraved. Um, I, I used it with my kids, uh, you know, when they were little. Like, I mean, you're just depraved. You know, so they understand what depravity is now. But it doesn't always mean you're as depraved as you could be. And sometimes we hear that and we read these words and we think, well, that's talking about those people that do those horrible things. But even quoting C.S. Lewis, and I think here, it's any time that you follow your own passions and carrying out your own desires of what you want, rather than what honors God, it is, in fact, depravity. It's your nature being more influenced by that than it is by uh, who Christ is. The final one is doomed. Uh, you're deceived, depraved, and finally doomed. It says there at the end, of that verse, uh, it says, and the mind, and you are by nature children of wrath, like the rest of mankind. Uh, 
I, I consider this like dead men walking. And, you know, zombies have become a big thing in pop culture. And I've got a couple of shaking heads out there like, yeah, well, I do not understand that. Um, some people have called this the death culture, and they kind of celebrate that. And I'm not a zombie expert, so if any of you are out there, you can correct me later. But, you know, the weird thing about zombies is they are dead, and their body continues to decay. And as I understand about the early people that wrote about this, always I'm talking about fiction, uh, but in the, the early people that wrote about it, they always project is that the zombie just continually decayed until it was no more. And I think that's the way the picture is here, and that is that there's a slow decay, that even though you look like you're alive, you're moving, in fact, there is eventual death. And we don't like to talk about that in our culture today. In fact, being children of wrath means that you're under God's judgment. That's what that means. And outside of Christ, that is true of us. We are under God's judgment. In this current age, people are fine with the God of love, but they talk a little about judgment and very little about tolerance of those who do. They don't talk about holiness and righteousness. In so doing, we even as Christians can fail to understand the depth of God's mercy if we do not understand the depth of our depravity and the depth of what we were assigned to in judgment. But when we understand the grace of Jesus Christ, that shows us the beauty of God's mercy and what he has done for us and allows us to rejoice in it, which is what we now move to is our condition in Christ. So all the, the hard stuff is over here, all the politically incorrect stuff I have said. Uh, now we're going to move over to what does life in Christ look like? And so he picks it up with that great phrase, but God. These are true of all of you. This is where we were, but God, and God is the one who did something. And we see first that God works in us. Look at verses 4 and 5. But God, being rich in mercy, because of the great love with which he loved us, even while we were dead in trespasses and sins, and grab that, you don't have to clean your life up first. Christ died for you even while you are in your sins. And he says, come to me. Come to me. And he goes on. He says, even while we are dead in our trespasses and sins, Christ made us alive together with Christ. By grace, you have been saved. And there it is. The beauty of the gospel, love of God manifested through Christ so that we may have life both now and eternal. I used to think about eternal life just as a time period. Till God got me with John chapter 15 and verse 3. Jesus defines eternal life. Remember what he said? I got one head shake. He says, and this is eternal life, that they may know the Father <coughs> Or know the Son and whom he has sent. So it's the Father and the Son. It's knowing God. That's the essence and the center of eternal life. That begins today. But it will come in its fullness when we're in his presence. And yet, let's be clear, we're not going to step into his presence and understand everything about him. We're going to have an eternity to understand the depths of our great God. And so here, he says, he has worked this within us. He has given us breath. He has given us life. His motivation is love. And all of grace was extended to us so that we may have life now and everlasting. We have moved from dead men to those who are alive. And then he says God works for us in verses 6 and 7. He says, and Christ excuse me, and he raises us up with him and sees us at the right hand of the Heavenly Father that are in the place of Christ Jesus. So uh, this is really referring back a little bit to what we even studied uh, last week. Now, he did this. He sees us in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. For what purpose? So that in the coming age he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace and kindness towards us who are in Christ Jesus. He is working for us. He has done all of this that we may have this joy and this fullness in the age to come. And that's why he will say, Jesus will say in places, don't store for yourself treasures on earth, but store for yourself treasures on heaven. Now what Jesus was not necessarily saying is that you couldn't be successful in this life, but if that's all your goal is, and you're just building up treasures here, then 
it's all going to go away. But if you use those resources and if you use God that he has given you for kingdom purposes, for heavenly purposes, then you will enjoy that. And God will, in fact, show you great blessings in the age to come. And so we have a great hope because God works for us. But not always God work for us, but God works before us. And verse, the following verses pick that up. He talks about this form, by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not of your own doing, it is the gift of God. That's the gospel. That's the gospel. God's grace has worked in such a way that when we exercise faith, it's a gift of God that we then have eternal life. It's not a result of works. Why? So that no man may boast. See, so here's the thing about Christianity. People oftentimes may look at the church and they say, well, they're a bunch of hypocrites. And part of me wants to say, yeah, there's a lot of it. And so are you. Very few of us live to our perfect ideals. And in Christianity, very few people live to the perfect ideals of Christ. But the wonderful thing is that yet we are still saved because it's not our works that save us. And in fact, one of the great things about the Christian faith is all of us admitting that we have no good works that could get us to heaven, but we are all in the grace boat together. Now, the wonderful thing about this text is that God doesn't leave us there. In fact, he has a great plan for our lives. It says in verse 10, for we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. So we have a purpose. We have good works. But the order of this is extremely important. The good works don't get you into a relationship with God. Faith in Christ gets you there. And then the Spirit works in your life so that now works become part of your life. But if you get that mixed up, then you end up in a works-based salvation rather than a faith and grace-based salvation, which does work out in the daily experiences of our life. And I love that, that it says that God, for we are his workmanship. Uh, the, the Greek term there is poem, and you can get where we got the word poem from this word. Uh, and so in some senses you could say, you are God's piece of poetry. What he is doing in your life is his artistry. It's his masterpiece. And the way that works out is that we do good works. And the beauty of this is that God has prepared those works beforehand. So it's not us conjuring stuff up. It's stepping into what God has for us. Now, what are those good works for each one of us? Let me touch on that very quickly. You can hear some more about this uh, probably as we even talk this afternoon. Um, as we move forward. But here's what's important to know. You can discover what your good works are, first and foremost, by walking under the submission of God's Word and the power of the Spirit. And it's amazing just what God does as you have that mindset in your life. But you also may find that part of what God's calling is for you relates directly with your passions. What is it that you're passionate about? And it could be that God takes that passion and now makes it a ministry. Um, I, didn't, I usually ask permission to use examples up front from church members, and I didn't. So, uh, Barry, uh, forgive me for this. But, um, you know, we're looking at this night to shine opportunity uh, that shows and gives special consideration to those who are disabled or who, uh, like my son, are on the autistic spectrum and others. And uh, this is an opportunity. Tim Tebow Foundation runs it to give them a beautiful evening experience where they're celebrated. It kind of came out of the fact that a lot of kids never got to do things like prom, and so they do this. And so we're looking to do that as a church, and we're going to be partnering with another church right now. Well, the whole back story is to tell you, I'm, I'm sitting and listening to Barry talk about this and, and hearing and even seeing the tears begin to well up in his eyes because it's passion, right? It's a passion. And we all have them. Turkey tribe, not just the tribe. That, that's not the passion. It's what we do with that money that is raised that makes the difference. And so all of us have different passions. You know, for me, I love teaching God's Word. I love leading and shepherding God's people. And, you know, I went through a time and 
you know, even at my, when I wrapped up a church that I was ministering in, and there was a little bit of me that was saying, I don't know if I want to do this anymore. Why? Because I was burned out and emotionally and felt like I'd given everything and I was just kind of like, God, what do you want to do with me? And so I toyed with the idea of doing another career path. And this would have been a late career change. But I thought about that. But then more and more, as, as I just prayed about it, God was like, that's not the passion of your heart. The passion of your heart is to pastor, love people, and teach God's word. Go do that. Now, he could have allowed me to do that as a layperson working a secular job. And I would have done it. But God opened up my opportunity to come to Pinnacle Church. Why? Because part of it is the passion God has placed in my heart. You all have it. The second thing that you'll know as to what God may be preparing for your works is your experiences. What have you been through in life that now God can use that and redeem it to ministering to others? Paul talks about this in the book of 1 Corinthians when he said that uh, my sufferings are such that now I can comfort those who suffer. And all of us go through stuff in life. And my question is, if you allow God to take the stuff that you've gone through in life and turn it around to minister to others, that may be the very thing God is calling you to do. Uh, and those may be good things. It may be that you are an incredibly good businessman, a good, incredibly good leader, or uh, a, a woman who is on the front edge of breaking down those walls in the workplace. And you've had all these experiences, and you've seen God work in those. Now, how do you now begin to say, how do I pass that on to the next generation? It, it, I'm not saying we should change the name of Pinnacle Church, so don't hear this, but if we did, I would propose the name Legacy Church. What is the legacy that we're leaving? And a lot of that legacy for you personally comes from the experiences you've gone through <coughs> and how God redeems those for His glory, good and bad. And the final way that you know what God has called you to is your gifting. How has God uniquely gifted you? Now, I was going to do a raise of hands here, but I don't want to do that. How many of you actually know your spiritual gift? Um, I'm amazed at how oftentimes I ask that question. And some people don't even know what I'm talking about when I'm talking about spiritual gifts. But in the scriptures, there is the talk that the God gifts people with spiritual gifts to do and empower them for the work that he has called them to. My mom, uh, she used to always say, I don't know how long I have any spiritual gifts. Um, Jack back there is visiting. He's known my mom for um, maybe longer than I have. Not close, but uh, a long time. And, uh, and, and we all kind of laughed when she said that. Because every one of us as kids would say, we'll give you two right off the bat. Hospitality. She has always opened her home. And in fact, when we were growing up, they built an addition onto our house for one purpose. So we could bring our friends there. Now, in my dad's mind, it was, I could watch him. <laughs> you know, it, if they're all coming over here, we kind of know what they're doing. For my mom, it was hospitality. She just loved setting that up. And she continued to do that, uh, from planting churches and people meeting in the home, uh, all the way to, uh, even today, it's hard for her not to be able to host the whole family, because that's what she does. Her gift is hospitality, and other one is helps. So when I has a problem, she steps in. And, you know, I'm one of those people that can go... I can be so unaware of the practical needs of people around me. It's embarrassing. God gave me a wife that sees those things. So she can say, you know, I'm here. Well, my mom was that type. She would see those needs, and she has a gift of helps to step in and do it. We all have gifts. Some of them are upfront gifts like leadership and teaching. Um, but I think the, the other gifts are probably more prominent. In other words, people, there's more people that have them. Because of what it takes to be the church of Jesus Christ, the body of Christ, one another, service, helps, hospitality. I mean, if those things aren't operating in the body of Christ, it is not the body of Christ. And so God gives that, giving all of those gifts. And as we go through into next year, I hope we have an opportunity to actually explore what our gifts are. And we can do that together and then uh, see what God might do through our serving together. So as we wrap up this text just want to put this out to you and if your life is more characterized by the first part of these verses then I want to encourage you to come to Christ he has hope he has fulfillment he has flourishing from you for you and I will tell you that nothing you'll pursue 
in your own flesh will ever fill you. It'll never fill you. It'll never be complete. You'll always have more you'll need. But in Christ, you can find completion and fullness. If you're on the other side of the spectrum, on the other side of but God, uh, I just want to encourage you to live like a person that's alive from the dead. <laughs> live in the good works that God has called you to. When I think about the future Pinnacle Church, we'll talk a little bit about vision this afternoon if you come to the town hall. We're still, as some of the leaders, working to what, what's God calling us to. But here's what I do know, that this church will never fulfill all God has for it unless all of us in this room that consider Pinnacle part of our lives if we don't invest time and resources. That's why God's designed the body of Christ. And one of the dangers we have in our world today is we build the body of Christ around a man, a human man, a good speaker, prominent leader. Yet the body of Christ was never designed that way. People gifted in those areas are important to the body of Christ, but that's all it is. You'll never see maturity in individuals. You'll never see full care. But when the body of Christ is activated, that's where transformation happens. And so my prayer is that as we move into the future, every one of you will say, I know what my role is. Now, for some of you, your role will be what I call a big hat, a little hat. The big hat is the thing that you're passionate about, you're gifted in, and you go and you do. Others, the little hat, are the things that the church just simply needs you to do. Um, maybe you don't have the gift of helps, but guess what? You can come set up chairs. Um, now, those of you with the, the gift of helps saying, I love setting up chairs. You know, for others, uh, not my main thing, but if the church needs it, I'll do it. And so as we live our lives together, we'll have opportunity to do those things that we're passionate about and we're gifted about. We'll do other things that the body of Christ needs us to do. And so we do it. And so my prayer is as we move forward that one, those that are without Christ come to Christ, experience the fullness of life, and those of us who have experienced the fullness of life and know Christ will be mobilized to be His hands and feet in the restoration process that He is currently in. And may God have the glory for that. Let me pray. And then could, uh, could you lead us out on maybe that Living Hope song, just a little rephrase of it, and then I'll stand up and say a final word of benediction. But let me pray. Father God, we, we look at your word, and we are so thankful that, first of all, you have taken us from darkness and transferred us into the kingdom of light. Something we could not do for ourselves, you have done for us. We worship you for that this morning. You are our hope both now and eternal. In Christ's name, amen. amen. Hallelujah. <laughs> Praise the one who set me free. Hallelujah. Death has lost its grip on me. You have broken every chain. There's salvation in majesty, dominion, and authority before all time, 
both now and forever. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen.